Hello everyone, uh, this is Sergio Sevillano. Thank you very much for coming to my talk. Today I'm going to be talking about how to calculate Feynman rules in scalar tensor theories and not to collapse in the process. Well, first of all, um, this is going to be a talk that is more or less theoretical, but I'm going to be focusing on something that in the end of the day is going to be more phenomenological. So yeah, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, stick to the talk. So uh, everything is based on this paper that was written with Edmund Copland, Peter Millington and Michael Spanowski and is on a tool created for Mathematica uh, called FineMG. Well, first of all, what are scalar tensor theories? Well, to know what are scalar tensor theories, first we need to know what is the standard gravitational theory that we are working with. So this standard gravitational theory is known by everyone and is the uh, general relativity. But, of course, general relativity normally has this piece that contains all the curvature from your action and then this other piece that contains the matter action. For, so, for example, for our model right now, this would be the standard model and over here we would put, well, what you see there, this is the curvature and the Planck mass. Now, it is important to notice that here the Planck mass is uh, related to the strength of the gravitational interactions. So, the smaller is the Planck mass, actually, the stronger are going to be the gravitational interactions. However, as you might know, this might not be the whole story because mm, this whole theory uh, has some, some things that we cannot yet explain. Now, in order to understand what are these scalar tensor theories, we are, I'm going to use one of the best examples uh, for their uses, basically. And this is the large number hypothesis proposed by Dirac. Basically, Dirac, after doing all his work and all of that, uh, he notices we were starting getting some uh, data from from the universe and he notices that the ratio of the um, speed of light t here is the uh, h of the universe and r sub e is the, um, the um, radius of the electron he noticed that that ratio had a really big number and this is dimensionless this doesn't depend on the dimensions that you choose this was 10 to the 42 but in the same way the ratio between the charge squared over this is also related to the strength of gravity the mass of the proton and the mass of the electron was also around that uh, big number so they were all more or less of the same order and he said okay this is a very big coincidence what if maybe what is happening is that g here in the second equation goes as 1 over t such that when we have 1 over t over here this will lead to some uh, number that is of the same order because t will go to 10 to the 40 uh, 1 over g will go also 10 to the 40 and so we get the same ratio but of course this is my uh, some, a little bit weird because this would imply that the gravitational constant is changing with time we don't have any model that can explain that for example we cannot just put here some function of time because that will break all the um, Lorentz invariants, for instance, that we have in our action. This breaks all the symmetries and all the formalism that we have created within our relativity. However, he was lucky. Well, he wasn't lucky, but I, around that time, the thing is that there were already people working on similar ideas. So, for example, here you can see, uh, this is Jordan uh, Brand Sandiki. Uh, you can see that basically uh, they were working on a theory that had a scalar field coupled to the Ricci scalar. Now, this scalar field is going to evolve, so it's going to give some effect that is similar to what we were talking about. Now, depending on the, uh, of the backing expectation value of this scalar field, we are going to be able to define our effective Planck mass. In this way, if the scalar field varies with time, what we are going to find is that at some points the, um, the gravitational interaction is stronger and at some points the gravitational interaction is weaker. And all of that is going to be given depending on the evolution um, upon its potential. So this is now a consistent theory of a changing gravitational force. Now, it's important to say something. This is one of the theories of modified gravity, one of the first modified gravities. However, this is not MOND. It's important to state that this is not MOND because normally MOND has, uh, doesn't have any action to describe it. We have to go outside of general relativity and we are saying that general relativity is wrong. However, here we are not saying that. General relativity, we are giving it for granted. The only thing that we are doing is saying, what if maybe we don't have uh, the Einstein-Hilbert action that we always give for granted? What if maybe the Einstein-Hilbert action is something else? And in this case, we, let's study the implications. And of course, the thing is that uh, these theories are very standard for, for um, when we study both general relativity 
and quantum field theory. For example, uh, from an effective field uh, theory point of view, every time we do some renormalization, these kind of couplings appear everywhere. So you see here these kind of couplings. In the same way, more fundamental theories of gravity, as a string theory, when they compactify the dimension, they also get terms like this. Well, maybe this scalar field is known as the Villaton, for example. And all of these theories that basically couple the rich scalar or some uh, curvature term and a scalar field are normally called scalar tensor theories. Now, as I said before, this is not going to be free. You cannot just change the gravitational action, action and get away with it. This is going to introduce new dynamics into the system, and these new dynamics are called fit forces in, in, in cosmology. However, they, uh, uh, they, um, they might be called also, I mean, they will present us new dynamics in the system. Uh, they have been studied quite a lot and constraints, so for example, in cosmological scales, they can produce, I don't know, gravitational waves. In the solar system scales, it has been constrained by the Cassini spacecraft, by measuring uh, ray lights from, from it to the Earth. And also, it has been proposed to be studied in atomic scales, so basically using atom interferometry. Here you see some uh, references, if you want to read a little bit more about it. And what happens that we said, okay, let's try to go one step beyond. Let's try to study also in the subatomic scale. So using particle theory, trying to unveil the effect that the modification of gravity will have in the standard model and use quantum field theory techniques to study these kind of theories and see if they are consistent. Now, in order to do this, we need to kind of forget about gravity because we are really used to work with modifications of the standard model, like beyond the standard models of theories, but of course, uh, general relativity is always more tricky to work with. So, to do this, what we are going to do is follow this plan that you see over there. We are going to, uh, starting from a modified theory of gravity plus the standard model, using uh, field theory, we are going to try to make some redefinition such that we end with general relativity and a beyond the standard model theory. And so we can ignore general relativity, as we, are, we usually do, and get all the modifications directly as a beyond the standard model theory. Okay, so in order to do this, let's get an example. And the best example I would say that is the branch Dickey action. It's very easy to see how this kind of modification from modified gravity to beyond the standard model can be done. So this is the theory that I presented you before. Remember that now the, the Planck mass is going to be given by the uh, Viking expectation value of this field. And um, so it's very simple to see this transformation. Basically, one of the best ways to do it, and it's the way that everyone normally uses, is called going to the Einstein frame or transforming to the Einstein frame. What we do here is taking the metric and making a conformal transformation. And in this conformal transformation, you see, it is going to depend on uh, the function f of x. And when we go to the Einstein frame, basically, this conformal transformation has gotten us a um, a canonical Einstein-Hilbert term for gravity. And so all the modifications that are not here anymore, they appear in the standard model. So, as I told you before, this is nothing but general relativity because of this term and the standard model, uh, beyond the standard model, because of that modified term. However, before I showed you um, more terms, that, sorry, uh, um, an example that had lots of terms that are not trivial. Maybe there are some of them that we cannot do this trick, we can never find a conformal transformation that take us to this uh, Einstein frame. Okay, so in that case, we need to do what is called stay in the Jordan frame. For that, the only way we can go, uh, uh, we can go to this uh, beyond the standard model description is by um, linearizing gravity. So starting with, again, modified gravity and a standard model, linearizing gravity and making some redefinitions, we will end soon with general relativity and beyond a standard model. This can be seen, so starting with the same theory as before, the linearization of gravity is nothing but taking this limit, where, where this is the flat space-time and this is just the perturbation. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details, but they are, for example, in the paper that you see up here. Um, doing the first uh, and focusing only on the, um, on the gravitational action, we will find something like this. So these two terms are the first Pauli action. If you know, don't know them, this is basically when you linearize general relativity, uh, well, the Einstein-Hilbert action, you get these two terms as the kinetic energy of the graviton. So this is perfect that we get this term, because it means that uh, we find somewhere where, it, where the standard general relativity is. But the most important thing over here is this term. Because as you can tell, there is a kinetic mixing. Once we expand around the vacuum expectation value and this becomes a constant, this is going to be a kinetic mixing that we need to solve. 
and of course we can solve it. And solving it means, so um, in, in case you don't know, sorry, the kinetic mixing means that every time a graviton is propagating through space, it is going to be changing back and forward into an X particle. And so we are going to have infinite number of diagrams for its gravitational interaction, and this new infinite number of diagrams are what we call the field forces. Now, if we um, linearize this uh, uh, diagonal, sorry, this vertex, what we are going to get now is from only one graph, we get two graphs, one with gravity and another with the field forces. This uh, sigma is now the particle that only transmits the field forces. So you see it is right there. Here we have gra modified gravity because every time gravity interacts with a, with a particle has to go through all the different modifications. Starting from this, the diagonalization has taken us to a theory that has standard general relativity, so the einstein hilbert action, plus some term that is going to introduce new, new forces. And this term that introduced new forces is now going to be uh, beyond the standard model term. Okay, that's perfect. Once we have that, this is great. We can start calculating quantum corrections, scattering amplitudes, and even see if there is any new, new prediction for, I don't know, for colliders or any kind of experiment. However, there is a problem. So far, I have only showed you the most simple toy models. We take the most simple uh, standard model actions. Well, not standard model action, but we haven't even introduced any terms in the standard model, and also we have uh, worked with the simplest mod theory of modified gravity. Of course, when you start doing this for more and more and more complicated theories, it is very difficult to do it. And the worst thing is that it's not difficult because, I don't know, it takes uh, a lot of time to figure it out. It is difficult because it ha there are many terms, and you need to make sure that you are uh, doing everything correctly, you are not missing any minus, you are not missing any factor of two. And for example here, for the simplest Jordan frame calculation, we have to expand gravity, canonically normalize the, uh, the um, scalar fields, expand around the VEBS, which is not easy at all, the VEBS is back in expectation values, solve the kinetic missing that I showed you before, and also deal with mass mixing that may appear. And even if we go to the Einstein frame, it's not going to be easier because you have in the standard model, for example, up to 200 terms that you need to consider one by one. So this is, uh, I mean, this is problematic because if you try to do it uh, one by one, what is going to happen is probably you're going to collapse, as I said in the, in, the, in the title. So this is the collapse I'm talking about. And what it means is that it is almost impossible to study scalar tensor theories consistently. Why almost? Because, I mean, you can do the calculations by hand, but it's going to take you almost, I mean, really a chunk of your, of your life. Uh, so at this point, so um, for instance, I did this calculation for my first paper, and when I, we were going to start my second paper in my PhD, uh, I already saw what was coming. I was taking another model more complicated, and I studied it again, and another model, and I studied it again. And I said, okay, I don't want to do this again, because, yeah, this is very tedious. What if we find a way of getting with a computer? So let's get a computer and um, and make it calculate all this kind of process because I, I said that they were tedious and not complicated, just very re repetitive, but with many terms. So let's learn from particle phenomenologists, which is really great. <clears throat> For instance, they use fine rules. Fine rules is an a mathematical package that what it does is taking a model file where you define the fields, the parameters, and some Lagrangian, so you give the Lagrangian to the, to the package, it is going to tell you <clears throat> the list of Feynman rules. Now, you may say, well, this is easy. Is, is, I mean, I can see a Lagrangian and calculate the Feynman rules, it's not that bad. Well, I can tell you that when you have many, many terms, as I said before, it's very tricky to do all of this. And the best thing about Feynman rules is that because it's so useful, there has been, since it was published, many packages being created that allows you to do phenomenology. So, for example, Fine Arts allows you to create all the different diagrams, Fine can calculate the scattering amplitudes and math graph, even calculate um, the cross sections. So, it is... Um, it is very helpful and key to do phenomenology with uh, beyond the standard model theories. So that's the thing, why don't we use these packets to study scalar tensor theories? Well, it's very simple, because you see here that we need a Lagrangian in flight space-time, and the only Lagrangian with flight space-time here is not this over here, because we need to actually consider gravity. We always have to take this limit over here. We need to reach the beyond the standard model limit such that we can um, um, introduce it into fine rules to do all the phenomenology. And of course this was the difficult bit. The difficult bit was not just considered the Lagrangian, the difficult bit was getting to this point. So what can we do? Well, now it's easier because we have created the package FineMG. So FineMG is a package of fine rules that what it's going to do is help you along the way. So I told you before that the calculations were very difficult, right? So now you can just take um, uh, any model file or the ones that I showed you uh, before for fine rules 
and introduce any um, gravitational um, kind of scalar tensor theory gravitational piece and any new degrees of freedom over there and with functions defining fine mg you can linearize gravity can only analyze no, uh, the, the scalar fields web expand um, deal with the kinetic mixings with the mass mixings and much more because what basically is going to do is take you from the modified theory of gravity plus standard model to your uh, theory of standard gravity plus beyond the standard model once you have that, the best thing is you can test scalar tensor theories in colliders because, of course, now you have the fine MG package within fine rules. You can then use all these packages that I told you about the, that they are amazing and with that generate, um, I don't know, any kind of uh, prediction to the phenomenology for scalar tensor theories. And I'm going to show you very quickly an example, one of my uh, favorite calculations that is basically using this one over here, MatGraph. So MatGraph also allows you to calculate lots of diagrams, as you see here. In the left, you can tell the diagram that I showed you before, um, that basically you have to diagonalize. Well, doing that diagram for my first paper took me like three, four months of learning, making mistakes, not finding the correct gauge choice, not finding the minus sign, as I said before. So it takes really long, which either means that I'm quite bad at physics or it's very difficult. And hopefully, it's not the first, uh, the first choice. Now, using MatGraph here, what I did is, what I told you after that, that is using fine MG and fine rules to define the, um, the, uh, the beyond the standard model theory, and then I put the theory into MatGraph, which is very easy to do. Once I had that, basically I asked him to, um, to generate all these uh, kind of processes, so two electrons and two positrons incoming and two positrons outgoing with a photon and a chi particle. The chi particle here is the fifth force particle. You see here that it generated 344 different diagrams, something that would take me really long to check that I have all 144, uh, 344 uh, diagrams. Well, I'm going to uh, give you one second to think about maybe how long it took. Okay, try to guess. It took actually for the package to generate all of this just 1.2 seconds. So here you can see the power of using a computer to do this kind of computations. It is really good at doing it and it's going to save you a lot of time to actually consider different models and find the one that best, uh, that gives the best uh, kind of observations or, or uh, constraints for modified theories of gravity. Moreover, these packets can work with any kind of scalar tensor theory. It's not only for uh, branch decay theories. So yeah, as a conclusion, scalar tensor theories can be studied as particle theory through a beyond the standard model uh, description and fine MG is going to help you through that calculation. Once you have that, as it is fine inside fine rules, you can use all the compatible packages to do phenomenology studies and um, hopefully discover something new in any particle accelerator. So thank you very much for listening to my talk. I hope you liked it. Here you have the link to GitLab in case you want to check it. You can find over there some uh, example guides and, and, yeah, and the paper in order to know how to use it, uh, what can it done and how powerful it is. And of course, if you have any doubt, just draw me an email or come to my discussion session. Goodbye.